Good morning, precious church. Precious preacher. Well, this is Michigan, so it was cold when we got in here this morning. But of all the places in the world, Christians in Michigan should know how to have close affection and fellowship, and it's called snuggling. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go, Don. I see, you know, I didn't see much of it, though, this morning. So if you get too cold, just move a little closer to the brother or sister next to you, and, and it'll, all, it'll all work out in the end. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And then uh, Frank kind of got thinking ahead of me a little bit there because we're going to get to the next few verses a little bit later on in our lesson. In my own personal spiritual walk with the Lord throughout these last 40 years or so, I can tell you that there are some areas where I feel like I do pretty well. You're probably that way too. You know, there's so many aspects of our faith. And some different aspects of that, we, we feel like we can do well. Some people have a giftedness for things like, you know, diligence and attendance. I've always been able to, to be pretty good about that. Being my job, it probably helps with that some. But then others have a gift for giving and others have a gift for service. And so there are different areas where each of us, because we're individuals and we all have free will, as Jason talked about this morning, there are different areas where some of us are stronger than others. And in those areas where we're weak, others may be strong and they may be weak in the areas where we struggle. But I, I think maybe there's one area, and this has been true across the board with most believers, when you get down into serious conversation, private conversation, I have never felt, and this is kind of a tough admission for a preacher, but I have never felt like my prayer life was where it needed to be. Because in some ways, and understand as I say this, that I study the Bible a lot. And I have all of my life. I mean, that's what I do. That's pretty much what the, the core of my entire life's work is. And even with all of my study of Scripture, in some ways, I wonder if I know what prayer is in some aspects. What I mean by that is, let's just think about some parts of prayer. We gather here, and we pray every single week. What are, you know, one fellow stands up here, and he'll be leading us in prayer. But what do the rest of us do? You know, the scriptures don't really tell you. I've looked cover to cover. And so in an assembly of this size, we have one person up here verbally praying to the Lord and a whole bunch of other folks who are praying along with him. And I'm not denying that or that that's a part of worship. It is. But what are we supposed to do? I have, you know, engaged in a lot of things during that through the years. I've tried not to be distracted, but that's happened at times. At other times, I've tried to say the same words that that person's saying, you know, kind of since they're leading the prayer. But the problem with that is that that's not a little bit disingenuous. That's not really coming from me. That's coming from someone else. And maybe that's how it's supposed to be. I don't know. Or other times I've kind of had my own prayer that I walked through in my mind, or even I've gotten to where I start to say my prayers even aloud, even if it's a little mumble. I figure the Lord doesn't need hearing aids. He can hear really, really well. So even if I mumble it, when I first started doing that a few years ago, Lenore started looking at me, what are you doing? You know, and, it's, and I told her, I said, well, I've been reading and I just can't find very much about silent prayer in scripture. Why did Jesus tell his disciples to go into a room and pray when you could just pray in your head? You ever thought about that? But that's what he said. If prayer is just something that happens in my head, then why would I need to go in private when I can be in private no matter how many people are around if I can pray up here, right? And I'm not saying necessarily God doesn't hear that because the Bible says he knows the thoughts of the wise. 
So I'm not making arguments in this. I'm simply trying to express my own personal frustration through the years and not really having answers. And, you know, this is a pretty big thing to want to get right, isn't it? Because we're talking about relationship, communication with God. And then when I do pray by myself, I know Christians have got to be considered to be the craziest people in the world by other drivers. Because if you're like me, I pray a lot when I'm driving. And it's out loud. Because I, like I said, I'm trying to pray more out loud than ever before. And so it looks like we're talking to ourselves. But, but as I'm praying, you know, I, I know God wants a real relationship with me. A, a friendship relationship like he had with Abraham, the friend of God. Like he had with Moses and he had with David and all those, Daniel and all those great heroes of faith. And so that means that I would need to speak to him as a friend in real relationship, not some formal only type of relationship. I mean, can you imagine if our children came to us or our dearest friends? I mean, Daniel is one of my dearest friends. And Daniel's the youth minister. I'm the pulpit minister. What if every time he spoke to me, it was just in regard to my position, in regard to my role? What if every time I talked to Don, every time I talked to John or to Mike, it was just, oh, elder, oh, ye elder. I come before ye with a request. We need more paper. <laughs> Couldst thou order that paper? You know, I mean, I don't know. They'd say, ah, thou request is for the deacons. <laughs> you know, and, and I know I'm being a little silly, but do you understand what I'm getting at here? Yeah. <laughs> no. Don and I joke. Dan and I talk about everything under the sun, from superheroes to football. That's what it means. Now, here's the thing, though. I still respect the elders. I don't think they've ever, in conversation, felt disrespected by me. And if so, I repent of that. But we can be friends and still have an authority role, can't we? Dan and I, he knows I'm the pulpit minister. I know he's the youth minister. But there's a mutual respect and we never, just because we're not formal and it's just requests and, and I thank for, for you. I mean, that would be uncomfortable, wouldn't it? If every time your friend came to you, all they did was just tell you how great you are. I mean, and I'm not saying we don't need to praise God. We do. None of this is to make theological application. It's just to make the point. Does anybody know what to do when it comes to prayer? I mean the specifics of it. No, I, I don't. I'm just praying, Lord, help me with it. As I'm, because I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to pray without ceasing. I want to have a real relationship with Him. But the scriptures just kind of let us work it out with fear and trembling, right? But they do give us some generalities. And the only thing I know to do to improve the specifics of my prayer is to work from those broad concepts and try to apply them every day. Along with those other concepts that are easy to forget, like we want to approach God as we would, not just one that we respect. We can never lose that respect. We can never forget He is God and I am not but to approach him in relationship, real relationship, not just formality, principles like that. But in scripture, there is a lot of broad, meaningful instruction, and most of it is given by Jesus himself. In fact, when we look over in Luke chapter 11, one through four, that was read for us just a few moments ago, this is one of the accounts where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. Of course, the other is included in the Sermon on the Mount. And it tells us here, and it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now, I'll tell you, I'm encouraged by that, because the disciples didn't know what to do either. Did they? 
They said, they hear Jesus pray. And what must it have been like to hear the Son of God speak to the Father God? To be there and to hear that with your own ears. And they want that. They want to have that kind of intimacy, that kind of real relationship. So they ask Jesus, Jesus teaches to pray. And the Lord gives them these instructions. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins that we may forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And let it lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I've preached many lessons. And you've heard many lessons that break down this prayer. I mean, first of all, we see that there is adoration and praise of God. So our prayers need to include that. I'm not telling us to remove those things. It needs to include that. He starts off with praising God. And he says, Lord, I want your will. Now that's one where I think maybe I've fallen short. Is do I always in the beginning of my prayer, at the heart of my prayer, do I express, Lord, I want what you want? You see, it's so easy to express in prayer what we want, what we need. But I'll tell you, in real relationships... It is a powerful thing to express first how much you care and are concerned about the other person. That's one thing I do appreciate about old Daniel. Daniel, he, I mean, almost every day he'll ask me, first, before we get into conversation about football or superheroes or whatever we talk about, he's going to ask, how you doing? Especially if he sees a different look on my face or maybe, you know, my emotions are showing I'm stressed or tired or whatever. He's always going to, how you doing? And it's with that tone of, are you all right? And even though the majority of our conversation isn't centered around that, usually, it begins with a clear understanding that this is my friend, and this friend cares about me, my wants, my desires, my needs. And that's how Jesus tells them to start this. Praise God. Express that you want what he wants that you care about what he cares about. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. He says, make your requests. And that's not uncommon in close, intimate relationships to ask someone, hey, listen, I need a favor. You ever do that in your, with your friends, with your family? Hey, listen, I need, you know, how you doing? Are you doing all right? Are you doing all right? I'm concerned about you. Hey, I need a favor. And it, he says, ask God. Ask God. Tell him, I need this help to not sin. I need this help with the things that I need for sustenance in my life. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I've often wondered, what does that mean? I don't know that the Lord leads us into temptation. As far as the Lord doesn't you know, the devil does that. And sometimes the Lord, if you look at the story of Job, he allows it. So what does this mean? Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the easy one, evil one. I think what he's really saying is, Lord, be interested in my life. Lord, be active and involved in every step I take, if you would. Hey, Lord, be with me. Lord, come along as I go here and I go there. And Lord, pave the road. Would you mind make it easier for me? Just not long ago, Seth was needing an inter, you know, he was trying to get an interview at a church. And sure enough, I called one of my friends that they would know and he would have connection with that church. And I just asked him, you know, we had all these, all these were components of the conversation. I said, hey, I need a favor. And then Towards the end, I said, would you mind calling and giving him a good reference? You know him. And, you know, it would just help to smooth the road. Smooth the road. You see, these components are talking about real communication. And Jesus is going to give us so many. But I'm going to just share four brief principles uh, that broadly apply to our prayer lives. As we try to involve our conversation with all of these these elements of real relationship, he's going to look over it. Look over with me in Luke chapter eighteen, just a few pages over. Luke eighteen verses nine through fourteen, 
And we have here, of course, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, which although it's talking about humility without question, it's really wrapped in the package about prayer. It says he spoke to the parables to some and he trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And he said, two men come up to the temple to pray and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased, and those who humble himself will be exalted. Well, basic rule number one, don't tell God how great you are. He don't need to know that. But really what he's talking about here is a prayer that is rooted that is built upon humility, humility. You know, they said, and I've read this, that social psychologists tell us that if you really want to endear someone to yourself, you don't just do things for them. It's actually more endearing to ask them to do things for you. Did you know that? That, that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's absolute fact, absolute fact. You know why that is? Because it establishes a need. And there's no greater compliment you can give another person than to need them. Now, if you do for them, that may imply they need you. Now, we need to serve. We need to do for people. I'm just making a principle from this. So what would it be like to stand before God and ever insinuate that he needs me? How did this... No matter how blinded he was by arrogance or pride, how did this Pharisee ever think that was an appropriate or wise idea? To insinuate that God needs me. No. It says the Lord was pleased with the tax collector, even though, and let's be clear, he has more sin, most likely, in his life, or at least more overt sin than the Pharisee. But I'll tell you, it's as much just like if you're raising kids. It's not so much about how many mistakes your kids make as it is about the attitude they have. God cares about attitude. And God cares about humility. It's about knowing what and who you are. And it, it's, it's not sometimes how the world misdefines it. In Numbers chapter 12, it talks about how Moses, he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Moses, he was a strong man. I mean, put his finger in the king, most powerful king in the world's face. You're going to let my people go or else? I mean, to lead those two million whiny babies for 40 years and deal with them? He got so upset. Talk about firm discipline. I mean, he takes the calf, grinds it into powder, puts it in their drink and makes them drink it. Moses wasn't weak. But he knew who he was before God. And in that conversation, there is only submission. There's only adoration and love. But you know, you can have a relationship like that and show extreme submission. Hopefully we have that with our kids. When my kids talk to me, they talk to me with the respect they would have for a father. And when we have that, I mean, you can have that relationship but it requires a clear, clear humility. A humility that says, Lord, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've accomplished, no matter how much I've achieved, Lord, I'm still just little me. And I stand before you. We go back to our text in Luke chapter 4. Excuse me, Luke chapter 11. And we start in verse 10. This was read for us by Brother George as well. It says, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, let me three loaves. 
For a friend of mine has come to me on a journey, and I have nothing set before him. Then he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him, because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise, give to him as he needs. And I say to you, Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks, it will be open. He says we should be a people who have a tenacity in prayer, who have a persistence in our prayer life. Remember the story about the woman who requested of a king, and Jesus insinuates that finally she nagged of him so much, she nagged him so much that he relented. Now, no one has ever preached a sermon on nagging God to death in your prayers. And that kind of gives a negative connotation that's not in Scripture. But that idea of persistency, that's all the way through, isn't it? That's what Jesus is saying here. You persist. You know why that is? Because leading up to Christmas, you know what your kids really want by how much they ask for it. Don't you? Dad, I want a we. Dad, I want a we. I will have the word we, not W-E, W-I-I, we. Remember that from several years ago? That will be emblazoned in my brain for eternity because I think my kids asked for that 600,000 times over the course of six months. And then they got it and they never played with it. But that's just how it works, you know? But, I mean, isn't that, doesn't that tell you? And aren't you so... I'll tell you, the things I'm most excited to give my kids or to give Lenora, she's the best because she does the happy clap when she gets something she wants, the happy clap. It's, it's the greatest thing. Sheer joy, pure joy. But when they've asked and asked, and I know, because I know they really want it, do you realize as the gift giver, that's the sweetest moment? Because you know this is going to make them so overjoyed. And, and the reward for the giver is the happy clapper. Oh, you know, and what I think is so amazing is people that ask God and ask God and ask God. And then when they receive, it's just like, oh, man. You know, and we do that, folks. We do. We should give as much thanks as we do request. Lord, fix this, fix this. But the Lord fixes it through providence. And so... The providence just seems like circumstances worked out. I've seen people who prayed for things, and then when it all worked out, they said, yeah, isn't it funny how things like that work out? What? That's like the kids getting the wee and saying, isn't it funny how I just got a wee? What? He says God wants us to be persistent. Our persistency in our prayer reveals our heart. Because it reveals what means the most to us. And that's relationship, folks. We look over in Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 8. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would say these words. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, who for when they love to stand in the synagogues and the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have seen their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When you pray, don't use repetitions like the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard by many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask. Now, he says two things here. First of all, he says when you pray, have a prayer that's in private. And then he says, don't pray to impress other people. And if we were to sum this up, what he's telling us is prayer life needs to have a simplicity. That's kind of what we addressed in the beginning with the these and the thousand, the formality. Jesus didn't teach a formality in prayer. He taught a simplicity in prayer because it's about relationship. It's about relationship. And this is another thing I struggle with when I pray in public. How, how, how extensive should that be? How extensive? 
Because where's the line between trying to impress other people with my prayer? Where's the line? Because if anybody says they've never done that who's led public prayer, I think there's a, an honesty issue going on. Because it's almost impossible to not think about what other people who hear you think. Now, I'm not saying we can't overcome it. We can't move past it. But maybe if we follow this idea of simplicity in prayer, there was a fellow who, when I was a teenager, it was back during the days of the long, eloquent prayers in the church. And we had one fellow who would get up, an older fellow who'd get up, and he said a very long prayer. It was like, you know, 10 to 12 minute prayer. And I remember because he said the exact same thing every time he prayed. And teenagers have quick minds, and we can memorize things quickly. And the ones that I sat with, and I, I'm not justifying this, okay? But I was a teenager. You've been there, so you can't judge it either. <laughs> But I remember that some of the kids on my road, they would be able to mouth the words of his prayer word for word. Here's the thing. I think it would have been more beneficial for us in prayer for him to get up and say, I'm going to lead a very brief prayer, and then I'm going to have a longer moment of silence so you can pray on your own to the Lord. And him to lead a prayer that's brief, that's profound and has nothing to do with us, but is directed straight to the Father. Nothing to do with us in the sense of that we'll be impressed by it. But just to the Father. Father, we love you. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. And Father, I, I mean, Lord, we do mean those words. But simplicity. Have we, have we wrapped our minds around the fact that Jesus in so many ways talked about simplicity? Because the thing is, is you can't have formality and have real relationship. It's, it's never done, is it? Where do you have real, I mean, best close friend relationship with formality? I think maybe that's why Jesus called God Abba, Father. And, you know, my kids seldom call me Father Carey. They call me the sweetest word in the world. Daddy. Now, I'm not going to use looser language when I stand before the church. I'm not going to do that. Because I wouldn't want anyone to ever think that I disrespect my father. The king of kings, the lord of lords. But when I'm praying on my own, if he's anything like, I mean, if he is, he's still magnificently more of a father than I'll ever be. He wants me. To approach him as a child to my father. And it needs to be simple. Because simple is authentic. Simple is real. Which leads us to the fourth thing that I've noticed that hopefully will help me and help you from Mark chapter 11. And in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, just one verse we examine here. It says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that I receive them, and you will have them. He says we must pray with expectancy. God has made us a lot of promises. He says things like, Lo, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says things like, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says things like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He says, Jesus says, don't worry about today or tomorrow. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, don't, they toil not, neither do they spin. How much more so will your God take care of you? He has made promises. And nothing frustrated me as a father more is when I tell my kids, I'll take care of it. And then they keep asking me, you know. And I understand if it's, just from the idea of persistency. Dad, but I really want this. No, no, no. I'm not meaning those issues. I mean the problem issues. You know, Dad, I really need you to get, get that FAFSA done for school or whatever it is. And I'm like, yeah, and I've got a plan. I'm going to do it on Thursday because of whatever reason. And then they're like, it's when the question sounds like they don't trust me. 
to do. I told you I'd do it. I'm your father. I'm going to do it. You see the difference between that and the request? I think when it comes to the things we need, we need to trust God and say, Lord, you've promised. So Lord, I really need your help with this. Look, Father, will you take care of this? And you know what he always does? There have been times we didn't know how we were going to do this or this. And Lord, take care of it. And we should have trusted him every time. He says, you need to pray with an expectancy in prayer. Now, there's different types of things we pray for. Just like there's different things our kids ask for. A we and getting your FAFSA done are two very different things, aren't they? So if you're asking your father, God, Lord, I, I don't know if I can overcome temptation. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. I mean, there are big things. You just need to ask him and trust him. Because a father doesn't let down his kids on stuff like that. But then there are other things. You know, Lord, I'd really like this new job. Lord, I'd really like this to happen or this to happen. Those are more like wants, right? Now, I've heard preachers preach that it's not right to ask God for your wants. Well, that's not much of a father-child relationship, is it? But the thing is, when it comes to your wants, you have to be just fine with the answer. But you can ask persistently. When it comes to your needs and the things that a father would never let his child down on, you don't need to pester him about those things. Because if you can trust him, you ain't got nothing to worry about. You just need to let him know about the problem. That's all your kids had to do with you, right? Just let you know. Then trust him. You see, there's so much about prayer we don't know. So much I don't know. But I want to have a great prayer life because I want to be his friend. He called Abraham the friend of God. And I've prayed, Lord, I know I'm not, but I want to be your greatest friend on the face of this earth. And I know I'm not. But I want to grow in it. And I want to grow closer and closer to him. I hope you do as well. And the thing is, is we can't do that without real, authentic communication. Psalm 109.4 says, In return for my love, they are my accusers. Talking about all the problems in the world, all the people in the world, the undependable nature of humanity. He says, but I give myself to prayer. You know what I find to be, and I'm, I struggle with this because I want to be better than I am. I want to pretend like I'm better than I am. But the thing is, it's easy for me to talk to Lenora. Yesterday we were packing, like, well, she did a lot of packing and I did a lot of moral support, but we did a lot of packing. <laughs> and we sat and talked for probably five hours about so many different things. And that conversation, I mean, there's humility. She knows I know, I know the truth. I'd be nothing without her. And there's humility in that. There's persistence. You know, well, Lenora, I really think we need to do this. Oh, don't you think we need it? And then, you know, there was certainly simplicity. No formality in that conversation. And there was expectancy. She said, we need to get this done. I said, we're going to get it done. There's expectancy. You understand? The things Jesus described don't fit this high church praying in Latin business or even what we've done sometimes, which is make prayer, especially public prayer, so much about how it sounds rather than communicating with the one we have real, authentic relationship This morning, if you want to work on your prayer life, you will be joining your preacher. And I bet 200 other people. Because I need to grow. I'm going to 
commit myself more. I do this every day, but I'm going to commit myself even more to grow. You need to improve your prayer life. Don't wait. Come up here and let's talk about how we can do it together as we stand and as we stand.